At one point, when reviewing the tape, listening in the dark, ears straining to hear some clue of what it was speaking to us, I felt it. A cold touch of fingers on my arm, as if someone wanted my attention, just tapping. Only, no one was sitting next to me. Welcome, boils and ghouls, to Three Gigs, the podcast that tells the stories of three shows that have had a profound effect on a performer's life and career. Their very first show, their best show, and their worst show. I'm your host, Dominic Davy, and today we're not doing any of that. Today is Halloween, and that means I have another ghost story for you. True ghost stories from the very theater my band, Tsunami Bomb, got its start. The Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, California. going to have to bear with me, my dear listeners. Unfortunately, I have lost my voice. I was at the fest this weekend in Florida. It's a giant punk rock festival, actually, in Gainesville, Florida, where my band performed. That's not what killed my voice. What killed my voice was talking to way too many people over way too loud music. But it is Halloween, and I couldn't deny you all a ghost story. So if you'll bear with me, I'll tell my tale about one of my favorite places in the world, the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, California. On October 23rd, in 2010, I was asked to join my friend Amy Bruni, a famous paranormal investigator, on a ghost hunt. How's that for a beginning? But this is true. I went to school with Amy for a time, and she went on to become a famous television paranormal investigator on uh, Ghost Hunters on Sci-Fi Channel. And now she has her own show called Kindred Spirits that I highly recommend. Amy has countless ghost stories and many adventures that are far more worthy of telling than I have, and I encourage you to go watch her on her show. But in this story, she plays a small but very important part. At the time... I had partnered up with Amy to make a series of t-shirts that she could sell at events that she would host around the country. Now she still does these kind of events through her company Strange Escapes, and I recommend you check it out, but she let me know she was going to host an event at the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, California, and she would like me to join her there to sell the shirts we had made. Ah, the Phoenix. If I told you half the stories that I know about that place, I could keep you here for hours. It's a magical place. But first... A little history. The Phoenix Theater was first opened in 1905 as the Hill Opera House, a small town opera house. In the early 1920s, it was nearly destroyed by a fire forcing the theater to be shut down. By 1925, it had been restored and opened as a movie theater, and the building was purchased by the California Movie Theater around 1935 and renamed California Theater. On August 5, 1957, another fire took off the roof of the building. The building was then restored once again and renamed the Showcase Theater by the Tocini family. And soon after the first live concert was put on the theater by Petaluma native Jeff Dornfield, the Tocinis employed a boy named Tom Gaffey, who managed to be rehired by Ken Frankel after the Frankel bought the theater in 1982. Gaffey was then named theater manager, and he renamed the theater after the mythological Phoenix, 
because the building seemed to constantly rise from the ashes. Gaffey ran the theater as a place for the children of Petaluma, California to use as they will, and he does so to this day. As a movie house, for plays, and most often, for concerts for local bands. Amy and I, like many children of Petaluma, had spent many nights there, and a great many bands had gotten their start on that stage, including my own, Tsunami Bomb. But again, that's another story. Now those of us who've grown up in the halls of the theater had all heard the stories. The noises, the sightings, the stories of Big Chris and the little boy, and the lady in the girl's bathroom, the projection room. They were the stuff of local legend, and if you were lucky, maybe your story was one of those legends. You had witnessed one of those things. Now this was a legend that Amy had decided to come home and host a party for. The event was simple. Fans would show up, each buying a ticket, socialize for a time, hopefully buy merch, then take part in a Q&A with the experienced ghost hunters that were there to help, including two television personalities, which included Amy. And then that would be followed by a late night paranormal investigation. I would help sell merch, and then I would take part in the investigation as Amy's guest. The event was very well attended, and many of the people there were fans of her show, the Q&A was fascinating, and I learned a great deal from the investigators that night, and I've shared that information many times over the years, so thanks for that. However, soon enough, it was time for the hunt, and that's where my story gets interesting. Now, a great many things were found that night, and with no prior knowledge or tips, the professional investigators led their teams of amateur investigators to the so-called hot spots right away. All the places that we had grown up knowing that there was something about that part of the building they all found. There were a great many hopeful things caught on cameras and recordings that turned out to be nothing very exciting, crushing more than a few of the guests' hopes. But there were also a great many interesting things found as well. Odd shadows where there should have been none, steps being heard walking across a stage, whispers on recordings. But I'm not going to tell you about any of that. I'm going to tell you about a room deep underneath the stage, where the furnace is. Being an old theater, there are a number of hidden little rooms and passageways in it. Now commonly, when there were shows of the Phoenix Theater, the green room that is used most often was a room built on the outside of the theater that leads to the back parking lot. Perfect for loading in. Years upon years of band graffiti adorn the walls, and the local kids call it the AFR. Don't ask why. Trust me, you don't want to know. Trust me. However, this is not the only backstage area at the Phoenix Theater. When you head backstage from the floor, by going stage left, you pass a curtain. And before you head up the narrow stairs to the backstage, you pass a door. And that door heads down a narrow stairway to the real green room, or the original one. It's a cavernous room that's much smaller and far older, but also covered in old graffiti, and it's only used most often when a bigger headliner would like more privacy than the general mix of the bands that the AFR provides. Most of the time it shows this is closed off, but if you go to the end of this room, there's another door. And this leads to another room, directly under the stage, where the furnace is. This is a strange little room, more like a proper basement, but not very big. A cement retaining wall rises up around the room, and it even has kind of a step where you could sit around the furnace, oddly enough. And there's a spot above the cement retaining wall where the dirt rises up underneath the large theater floor where everybody watches the shows from. It's dark and stretches out further than you can see. And when you shine your flashlight, it doesn't pierce to the end. It just goes on and on into the dark. It's pretty spooky looking. But if you've seen underneath any house, you have a general idea of what it looks like. Just darker. My little brother actually once explored it with some friends. But after he did it, he said he'd never go back. In fact, none of them said they would go back. But again, that's a whole nother story. Now this room, this spot, 
had almost been immediately identified as a hot spot. Because I had joined Amy and a small group of her guests down there to investigate it. Amy set down a black pen flashlight, the kind where you screw the bulb housing down on the handle that holds the battery to turn it on. She kept it very loose so that the slightest touch would turn it on and set it on the floor. She let everyone get comfortable, settle down. Well, I guess as comfortable as you can get in a dark, dusty, creepy room underneath a stage. And she asked if there was anyone there to answer her. And if they wanted to, they should activate the light just by touching it. She first asked if anyone was there. And the light came on. Once it shut off, she asked if it wanted to talk to us. And once again, the light came on. At this, she made a face. She then went to her bag and pulled out a red version of the pen flashlight she was already using. And after adjusting it so that it too would turn on at the slightest touch, she set it down next to the black one and then asked if the presence with us would turn on the red light. And the red one came on. And then she asked it to turn on the black one. And then the black one came on. She started asking a number of questions, much to the fascination of everyone in the room, myself included, and the flashlights would come on in any sequence that she asked. Noting my friend's continued thoughtful face, as this proceeded, I whispered if this was usual in her experience. No, she said. They don't usually work this fast or or even this responsive. Her questioning continued till at last it was time for a new team to take residence in the furnace room and this was much to the disappointment of everyone involved. However, I then realized that I was not actually assigned to any team. I was a floating guest, and I could go wherever I wanted. So I decided to stay in that dark and creepy room and see what else I could learn. What was happening? What was down there? What was talking to us through those flashlights? The next team had a couple leading it, and I'm sorry to say I forget their names and I wasn't able to find out in time for this recording. I know the gentleman was named Michael. The woman's name might have been Deborah. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Amy, if you hear this. I just can't recall. But they were interesting. They were apparently well-known EVP experts. Now, EVP, for those of you who don't know, stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. They are sounds found on electronic recordings that are interpreted as spirit voices that have either been unintentionally recorded or intentionally requested and recorded. Enthusiasts consider EVP to be a form of paranormal phenomenon often found in recordings with static or other background noise. However, many scientists regard EVP as a form of auditory pareidolia, interpreting random sounds as voices in one own, one's own language. And a pseudoscience embraced by popular culture. Now, some, who are more apathetic towards it, say it's people perceiving patterns in random information, equipment artifacts, or possible hoaxes. Now, what do I think? Well, I've seen people make much out of nothing, even on that very night. I've seen people hear what they want to hear, desperate for anything so much that they decide what they hear is exactly what they want it to be. So, it might be a bit of all of it. But on this night, I wasn't looking for anything in particular. And what I heard... Well... For the first session, they set up their recorder, and after everyone sat themselves down around the room, they asked everyone to introduce themselves slowly in the silence of that dark room. The woman investigator started by introducing themselves and asking the spirits to speak into the recorder. And the man named Mike spoke next, and then everyone introduced themselves, including me. Hello, my name is Dominic Davi. I grew up here in the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma. And I paused. I would love an opportunity to speak with you if you're here, and if you can. After that, the woman stopped recording and played it back. And there was no response until the very end of the recording when I had spoken. Hello, my name is Dominic Davi. I grew up here at the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, and, and in that pause that followed, 
Something whispered back. You did? The team of amateurs gasped out loud. Everybody reacted. The professional investigators looked at each other with excitement. It was so clear. They played it again. There was no denying it. Something responded to me. In a silence, when no one spoke. You did? So something was there. And it was talking to us. So they started recording again. They asked a number of questions, and there were noises heard, whispers we couldn't make out. However, it seemed to respond most when I asked something. As if being the only local in the room made me more interesting than the others. Perhaps that's why Amy had so much luck. She had spent a lot of time in the building, too. Was it those of us with history? Did we have something? More? Some greater connection? I don't know. At one point, when reviewing the tape, listening in the dark, ears straining to hear some clue of what it was speaking to us, I felt it. A cold touch of fingers on my arm, as if someone wanted my attention, just tapping. Only, no one was sitting next to me. The hairs on my head my neck, my arm, stood up straight, and I looked around. Nothing. I mentioned out loud what had happened to the excitement and envy of all the amateur investigators in the room. But I wasn't so sure this was something to be envied. Something had touched me on the arm in that room. And it wasn't... human. It wasn't... I didn't know what it was. But it had. I know what I felt. Their time almost up, the couple decided to record one more time, asking new questions. And one of them was, where in the room are you? I'll never forget the sound of her voice, loud and clear, and the long wait in the silence that followed, hoping for some response in that dark room. I know it sounds crazy, but even after being touched in the arm and highly spooked, I was still hoping for something more and that's when I got it when they played back the tape there was no response to any of their questions except for one the question where she had asked where in the room are you and there was a whispered response you could barely hear but it still was there <sighs> that's what it sounded like it was chilling the hairs on my neck stood up once more as soon as I heard it. And the woman spoke after the oohs and ahs of the amateur investigators had calmed down. I... I think it said Mike's neck, she said. That's interesting. Well, you guys don't know this, but Mike actually hurt his neck very recently. Mike nodded at this. I wonder why it's reacting to Mike's hurt neck. I mean, it could... That's... not what it said. I interrupted. All eyes and flashlights turned to me. And sitting there in the dark, I swallowed hard. I'm a brave man. But in that moment, the weight of the unknown felt a bit heavier on me than usual. Let's say that. Oh? She responded, confused. Play it again, please. I asked. She rewound it. I remember the noise of the buttons in the dark and played it again. She stopped it and looked at me. It's not saying Mike's neck, I said quietly. It's saying behind Dominic. Everybody sat quiet. They knew I was right. And I turned around slowly, looking out to the dirt that stretched out under the theater floor just behind me, the darkness swallowing the limit of the flashlights, where something was out there, watching us back, just beyond where we could see.
You've been listening to a special Halloween episode of the Three Gigs Podcast. I hope you enjoyed my story. It's all true. If you want to find out more about the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma, California, check out thephoenixtheater.com. If you'd like to get information on Amy Bruni's Strange Escapes, which I think I just inadvertently did a free advertisement for, you're welcome, Amy, you can check out strange-escapes.com. You can find out more about this podcast at 3gigspodcast.com. And if you have a moment and use iTunes, please leave the show a rating and review on our iTunes page by looking up 3 Gigs Podcast. It really helps people discover the show, and we're all about that. So thank you in advance. The theme music for today's episode was Cantare del Morte, the Halloween song by Tsunami Bomb, my band. And that's me singing, believe it or not, from the collection Trust No One out now on Kung Fu Records. Pick one up if you get a chance. The background music was called Collapse MYUU from Creepypasta Music. Thank you once again for listening to today's episode. It's a special one. I hope you enjoyed it. And once again, my name is Dominic Davi. This has been 3Gigs Podcast, and we'll see you next time. Happy Halloween. <laughs>